Hi everybody, it's good to see you again. And you know, um, we are made to see each other for eternity, not just a short time. So it's nice to know that uh, Christ made a way for, you know, he's bringing God's will together so we can all spend eternity with him on a, a new earth with a new heaven set on a new earth where this love is eternal with no sin, no death, no devil that is tempting us and testing us, but we'll continue to be faithful because we have the power of the Holy Spirit now to be faithful and to continue with Him. So what we're doing is we're going through the book of Ephesians, and today we're on chapter 3. So let's look at what Paul is teaching us and leading us as a true apostle of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Titus 2.1 But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Older men, be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. Older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, love their children, be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And that word blaspheme, it's to defame, revile, or slander. And likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. And here it talks about doctrine again, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Free gift of God, it brings salvation, and it's through faith, and it's appeared to all men. So both Jews and Gentiles teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our, of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort, rebuke with all authority, and let no one despise you. So back to Ephesians 3, 6. It says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. See, we need the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Isaiah, he symbolizes the uh, clean and the unclean, the wild and the tame coming together, that they're no longer fighting with swords and spears, but they're about the things of uh, like plowing a field and like pruning trees for more fruitfulness. The end of Isaiah talks about a new heaven and new earth also. And in Acts 26, 15, it says, So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, 
And it's for this reason here. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me, so that people can know him and be saved and not be stuck in this blindness that they are under by this power of Satan, but to come to the power of God. Ephesians 3.8 To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Okay, this fellowship of the mystery. It's a coming together in fellowships, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. And we have confirmation of that in John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. So here He is the Creator. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So they couldn't lay hold of it, they couldn't seize upon it. Or they did not. Many seized on to Barabbas, but not Jesus. Ephesians 3.10 To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the churches to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So look at this. They're making known this, this wisdom, and it's being known to these, uh, well, it looks like, what's it say? That the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, and that's the called out ones, the assembly out of the world, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. You know how God had these watchers, these messengers, these ones that they're like angelic, that they were asking questions, like in the book of Daniel, they were asking about this, uh, one of them was. And so they're interested in this, but this is being shown by these who are following Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit now, and it's being made known. And people are coming out of darkness and into light. All right, let's continue on. It's interesting that what we had in Zechariah and what was being shown partly to them. So let's look at Zechariah 3.1. Then he showed me Joshua. Now that's the same name as Jesus, God saves. The high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, I'm not sure what he is meaning there when he says, Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, is he talking about Satan or Joshua? Is it like Satan is just, <laughs> he is doomed for the fire, but he's right now, he's not in the fire. Or is it like Joshua that has been plucked from it? I'm not sure. But it says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Joshua is cleaned up and of course we know how God made this possible through Christ now Zechariah 3 6 and the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying thus says the Lord of hosts if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my command then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts I will give you places to walk among those who stand here Hear, O Joshua the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, 
for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, every one will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So I just think that's interesting. Of course, Jesus is that branch, and he's the stone that the builders rejected. And it's interesting that that stone has seven eyes because you see the lamb that was slain in Revelations has seven eyes and seven horns. So it's all completely powerful and all seeing. Jesus talked to us about who the neighbor is. Remember that parable of the Good Samaritan? Moses was not able to take them into the promised land, but another Joshua had taken him into the promised land. And that's where they were to have rest. You know, who gives us real rest is Christ in giving us his rest and taking us really into the promised land spiritually. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit that joints in the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, no creature hidden from his sight, no creation hidden from his sight. Now that makes me think, no creation hidden from his sight, even in the womb. The creation is not hidden from his sight. Us, he sees the inside. And some you know, all of us have been ones that, yeah, we want to make the outside of the cup clean. But Jesus said, look, on the inside is nothing but dead men's bones. So it's not about making the outside clean. We need a new cleansing from the inside, which means a new heart. And we can only have a new heart through Christ. And that's by turning to him who was put on the cross, died with our sins on him, them, so they could be wiped out. But he never sinned, so he's raised up, sitting at the right hand of God. And where he is, we can be also. And that's and all we need to do is turn to him faithfully to repent and be, be sorry for what we've done and turn humbly and obediently to him and follow him faithfully to the end. So let's continue in that. In Hebrews 6:19, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil. So remember to get into that Holy of Holies. They had a wall where only the high priest could go through once a year, but Christ has done it for us, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So here, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb that was slain, that was worthy to open seals. And this is the one, Him being the Lamb, because all this religious acts that we were doing, this was a shadow of what was to come. But we've been set free in Christ. And uh, wow, this is a great thing. So let's get back to Ephesians 3.14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, wow, and he is love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. So we can have a knowledge and, you know, logic and reasoning 
which are good, but there's even something that goes beyond that. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So there we have the end of Ephesians, but I wanted to go through a few more things about Ephesus. This is John's home church. Timothy, he was there, and they have the Temple of Diana, and that would be the Roman part, but the Greeks, Diana, they would call Artemis, and that was there. It was one of the seven wonders of the world, and you had this thing of the Nicolaitans and Gnostics. Well, the Nicolaitans, also called antinomians, which is against law, against legalism, but what they did was they had this unrestricted indulgence. They were morally lax. What mattered was not what you did, but what you believed. Possibly followers of Nicholas that you see in Acts 6, 5, but maybe not. The Gnostics, that was an er earlier term for antinomianism, and it's like the sects like the Manichaeans. They held that their spiritual being was unaffected by actions of matter and regarded the carnal sin as at worst a form of bodily disease. I've noticed some believers, they say, oh, we don't go by law. And some of them, they don't even read the Old Testament because they say we're in the New Testament and we don't go by law. But there's also this thing of being lawless, which that being lawless is not good either because, you know, it says uh, that, um, what does it say? Works or faith without works is dead. So if you do have faith, you actually will have works that are faithful also. So you will be doing good works. It's not just all, well, Christ loves me and I can do what I want. Like these Nicolaitans and Gnostics were, they were heading down the wrong road that way too. Okay, let's look at some of the things that oh, was going on in Ephesus with Paul. So let's look at Acts 19. It says, Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so people were getting baptized. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all, and he went into the synagogues and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. So Paul is talking about the things of the kingdom of God, and that reminds me how Daniel was speaking the things in the kingdom of God. And on the left here, the statue, you have the kingdoms of the world, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and this stone that hits it, kingdoms of the world begin to collapse, but this kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and it grows and continues to increase. And then on the right side, I have in Daniel chapter 7, you have nations as beasts. You have Babylon, maybe Persia, Greece, and Rome, but they come to fire, and you have an everlasting kingdom. So, interesting. Now, verse 9, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, remember the Christianity was called the way first, and then later they were called Christians at Antioch, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples Paul and the disciples had to withdraw because they had such hard hearts, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. Both Jews and Greeks were hearing this. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul, you know, he's a true apostle by the power of the Holy Spirit that things, these things were happening and confirmed. In Acts 9.13, we see some other things going on in Ephesus. Okay, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, now itinerant, that means they were traveling, they took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. So these itinerant Jews had been hearing this, and they tried it, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. 
And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord was magnified. Looking at fear of God and godly sorrow, let's look at 2 Corinthians 7, 1. It says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I do not say this to condemn. For I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, and that's Greece up there, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So here we have the Holy Spirit, and we have other people come together in the Holy Spirit with comfort. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was com comforted in you. Well, okay, so there in the Holy Spirit also comforting. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, and your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I did not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Wow, so that's like a good father or a good mother with a child there, isn't it? For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produced repentance, leading to salvation, their saving, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, and that indignation is a meeting out of justice, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So Paul is wanting something for them for good, not evil. In Acts 19.18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. So this is also going on in Ephesus right here. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So even these people that were practicing magic and occultish type stuff while wow, they were hearing the truth uh this word of god being proclaimed and all of a sudden these things that they had been following they turned to something that was not worth anything to them to where they could just burn it and uh now paul wasn't going around taking their books and burning them they were burning their own things because they counted them worthless for what they could get in christ which is uh you can't count the cost of that. It's priceless. Acts 19.24 For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, and remember that's in the Greek it'd be Artemis, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Okay, wow, that's something... You know, we have prosperity doctrines even within the church, I notice. But these men here, they're in their trade for prosperity. Moreover, you see and hear not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people, saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. 
So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. 28. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples wouldn't allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them didn't know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one of voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! And when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things can't be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of the temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly, for we are in danger of being called in question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. It looks like they were worried about that justice coming down on them because they didn't really have a reason to be assembling like that. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over the region, encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. You continue to have opposition as you're preaching the gospel. Well, that's part of uh, the walk, I guess. So let's look at Revelations 2.1 where we see Jesus speaking to Ephesus also. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else... I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds, and that's the deed, works, or actions, of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise God, if we want to be overcomers, God calls us to be more than overcomers, and He's given us the Spirit to do that. And Christ has a crown of life for those that love Him. So continue in uh, the love of Christ, and continue to be faithful, and share that good news, so knowledge of Him will continue to go out throughout the whole world, and increase. In the name of Jesus, amen.